Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's a beautiful day today. It's sunny out. And I hope you're all having a beautiful day in the place where you stay. Psalm 7, 17 says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Most High. With this in our mind, let's give thanks and let's praise God's name for all the blessings. May we count the blessings that God has given us. The opening song for today is My Faith Has Found. My Faith that Has Found, it will be played on the video now. Father, creator of the universe, thou art the only Lord worthy of worship. We acknowledge, O oh Father, that there is no other God besides thee. Thou the most compassionate, merciful, knower of everything that is happening in our lives. We completely surrender and commit our lives into your hands, into your cares. O oh Lord, help us to count the blessings. We know, O Lord, that all the blessings that we enjoy are only from you. Help us to be thankful. Many times our hearts go away from you and we do not see the good things that you have done for us. O Lord, help us to count our blessings and be thankful for every single thing that you have done in our lives. At this Sabbath morning, we ask you, Father, to be with each and everyone who's bowed down their heads before you. We pray for the ones who are watching us online. Be with them and may your blessings be poured upon them. We submit the Sabbath school into your hands, O oh Father. May every program in this Sabbath day be acceptable in your sight. 
and may we may and may it draw closer to you. May we all be ready to meet you when you come. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath once again. I want to welcome each one of you once again for this Sabbath school. And, uh, uh, today's uh, mission spotlight is entitled as Abundant by Father. Abundant by Father. Uh, Father always seems to be angry after Mother told him that she was going to an Adventist church. That's strange. Every thing irritated him. One night he exploded with rage when Mother arrived home late from a church event. Uh, the next morning, Mother arrived at the dental clinic where she worked as a secretary in a place called Manus, Brazil. And learned that she no longer had a job. Job had been disappeared. The clinic had been closed. Nowhere to go. What shall I do? And that's what the thought which surrounded the mind of this mother. On the way home, back home, she wondered how to tell the father. But the father noticed that his clothes were missing from the closet. He had left home. Mother didn't say a word to their son. The boy busy at school at the gamers club only noticed that father was gone three days later when he received a WhatsApp video message on his cell phone. Father said, Adventism and his faith no longer accepted. And that's what the message was given by the father. I'm never going to give up my religion, he said. You have to accept it. Mother had never heard about the great controversy between Christ and Satan, but she was worried. And she met with uh, Ricardo Corhel, the pastor of Alpha Seventh-day Adventist Community Church, weeping. She confided that Father worked as a condoned high priest and uh, deserted the family. You know, Pastor Ricardo comforted mother and opening his Bible said kindly, let me share some advice with you in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 3. He read, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. In Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1 he read, the wise woman builds her house but the foolish puts it down with her hand. She was in a dilemma, unable to decide what to do the pastor had been able to give this advice or read from the word of God what the Lord intended. A wise woman builds her house, but the foolish puts it down with a hand. Looking at the mother, he said, be a good wife to your husband and pray for him. Will it be possible? Weeks passed and the mother ran out of money. She found strength in the Bible and prayed. The promises which is recorded in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. It says, be strong and of good courage for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. When grandmother, father's mother learned that the family was low and food, she called the father and he began to deliver groceries for them. One day grandmother told mother that spirits had summoned her and Junior to the temple. When a pair arrived, their father was possessed by an evil spirit who spoke to him in a low, distorted voice. The spirit said father could be back home, but threatened to kill him if mother or junior tried to teach him about the religion or invite him to church. Father returned home that day. He had been gone for two months. Mother prayed even more to the father. What a heart. Or a transformed way of the mother could be able to still pray for the father who abandoned her when she was really in need. We're going to go back again the next week and uh, we will come to a consensus what happened to this family. Until uh, then, I don't want to encourage every individual who has been able to be a part today. May you be encouraged by the word of God. Make courage. Whatever the difficulty and circumstances, 
May the word of God come alive in our lives. As the Bible says, love your God and love your neighbors. And it goes forward and say, love your enemies too. May our practical religion exemplify who Christ is in our life. And through our lives, our family members might have an opportunity to see a beacon of light of Jesus in each one of our hearts. That's my prayer for you. Let's get into the Sabbath school lesson. We have uh, Dr. Murapasa Deepati with us, and I'm uh, very happy, sir, that you could be a part of us today. And I hand over the time to you now. A very happy Sabbath. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor, for that wonderful story. We praise the Lord that we have another opportunity to study God's Word through the lesson that we have in the quarterly. Uh, last week, uh, we studied uh, about various types of uh, crucibles, surprising uh, they may be, crucibles of uh, Satan, sin, purification, and uh, maturity. And uh, this week, uh, as you have noticed, we are forcing, focusing, we are focusing on uh, crucibles of maturity, crucibles of uh, maturity. While it is true that many of our troubles are created by us, God is ultimately the sovereign of the entire universe and the history of our nations as well as our individual lives. I've just read from teacher's comments and uh, today's, uh, in fact, this week's uh, lesson is um, bird cage, bird cage. And uh, we will uh, offer a short prayer that God will bless us by his spirit as we do this lesson. But right after the prayer, I want someone or a few of you to comment on the title itself, what a birdcage means to you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for another opportunity of studying your word. We praise you, Heavenly Father, for the lesson that we have uh, uh, read, studied, and understood. And now, Father, as we discuss and uh, share insights, Heavenly Father, we pray that your spirit will continue to lead us. Help us, Father, that we be drawn closer to you and closer to one another. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Okay, what is uh, the bird cage? As soon as you saw this title, what uh, impression did we get? What are the ideas? Uh, anyone can uh, share, please? Well, the bird... The bird cage means to me is that um, as the lessons point out that um, um, man is trying to train the bird in front of other noises all around to be paraphrasing and to make it shorter. But he, the bird is very distracted and it's not following the master command. But so he took it to the other side and when it is dark and gloom and when there is no noise in the rug, the bird is trying to grasp and learn the melody of the song the master is trying to teach. So for me as a personal, um, me as a personal, I feel that we are living in this world in the last two days of the world's uh, generation but we are surrounded with so many things that is distracting us and not making us to really concentrate on God and God alone and to be um, more of uh, in the spiritual side. So what um, I have taught my four children who are now adults and they are living there on their own that we should be uh, not, we should be in the world, but we should see what we have to grasp from God and all the distractions like worldly music and worldly things to be completely taken away through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and through the conviction of the Holy Spirit to draw us more closer to God day by day, even though we are distracted by so many things. That's what I learned and that's what I have taught my kids and I'm trying to teach my grandkids too. Okay, thank you so very much, sister. I could not see you, but uh, thank you. Your words were very clear. And uh, in fact, you have uh, summarized uh, the lesson 
and uh, he will also told us as to how we are training your children. Thank you so very much. Let's read uh, the key text that is given for us as memory text, as it is printed in the book. Uh, in this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Okay, please remember that we are looking at the crucibles of maturity. And uh, this we, we want to know that God is still in control of the people who are committed to serve him and that uh, he allows uh, no harm to come to them. In fact, no temptation will come to them unless uh, the Lord has a solution for all, all, all of them. So Peter is writing here. We will come back to this text later on, but uh, you see here, key words uh, in this, uh, you will greatly rejoice. We understand the desire of God, as Peter writes, is uh, that the servants of the Lord rejoice greatly. And another thing that we see here is that a little while, little while, that is, uh, problems of this world only are for a little while. Trials, temptations, and uh, crying, and... Um, all kinds of things against us are only for a little while, little while. But uh, rejoicing in Christ will continue throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. We'll come back to this text later. And the story is given for us in the Sabbath afternoon. And sister, thank you very much for helping us. Uh, uh, the author writes that the bird will not be able to learn the that the master is trying to teach unless his attractions are removed completely. So the master tried as the bird was in the cage, but later on he, he covers the cage and in pitch darkness, the master tries to teach the song and the, the bird is able to learn. And from this, the author writes that uh, a God deals with his children in a similar fashion. And then he has a song to teach us and when we have learned it amid the shadows of affliction, we can sing it ever afterward. This is from the Ministry of Healing by Ellen G. White, page 472. The point is that God wants to teach us so many things. He has a song to teach us and we are unable to learn. And so God puts us in darkness and in fact, that experience in darkness becomes a learning experience for us and that uh, we will be able to sing in light. What we learn in darkness, what we learn in hardships, we will be able to share in light, meaning rejoice with uh, those who love God. Okay, notice that uh, the one who carries the bird into the darkness is uh, the master himself. This is a very striking element in Christian experience. We want to be sure that sometimes it is God who takes us into darkness, God who takes us into hardships. And we will see that as we proceed in the lesson. It is easy to understand that Satan causes pain. Yes, he does everything possible to destroy our faith and causing pain. It is normal as we understand it is from Satan. But God himself actively takes part in guiding us into crucibles where we experience confusion are hurt. Pain comes from uh, Satan. This is what we understand, but this lesson is enabling us to understand that uh, even God takes us uh, into experiences of uh, pain. Of course, for a purpose, we'll see that. So, what examples can you think of in the Bible in which God himself leads people into experiences that he knows will include suffering? Any experience from the scripture that you thought uh, came to your mind as you studied the lesson? What examples can you think? Anyone to comment on this? God himself uh, uh, took his people into hardships, experiences of pain, suffering, yes. Joseph. We can't, uh, Job. Okay, Joseph. Joseph, yes. It is God who led Joseph into Egypt. Okay, okay. Yeah, what, what happens is that sometimes, even if it is the devil who is doing the activity, we understand that it is uh, God who is doing because God is allowing the devil to do it anyway. But if you see active participants of uh, 
um, the experience that Joseph had got jealous. And uh, I can safely say that uh, the devil worked on the hearts of uh, the brothers, and then these brothers actually inflicted pain on uh, Joseph. Okay. Any other example? What about Daniel? God, Daniel? Daniel? Okay. Yes, from Jerusalem, he was taken to Babylon, and there uh, he, of course, he was thrown into lion's den as well. Okay, let's move on. And as we move into the lesson, we will have more examples keep coming. But uh, in Sunday's lesson, to the promised land, we are uh, a dead end. Dead end, and then uh, the way continues still. The journey of the Israelites continue. Okay, the point is uh, that this is based on Exodus chapter 14, 14th chapter, where we have uh, the experience of the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea as God made way for them from the waters. In fact, a dry land appeared and all of them crossed the Red Sea. The picture is that before them is the Red Sea and either side there were mountains and of course behind them is, was the Egyptian army. No escape, no way of escape. In other words, they would be destroyed. That's the end, dead end, no way out. It's uh, definitely a big surprise for them because they were walking towards the promised land as Moses was leading and they would understand that it was God who directed uh, Moses to go to the promised land and uh, God delivered them from the Egyptian slavery and yet now they have uh, no escape. Okay, from the day the Israelites left Egypt to the day they reached the promised land, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of a fire to give them light so they could travel by night. This is wonderful. This is from Exodus 13 verse 21. But look at this. Every part of their journey was led by God himself. But look at where he led them first to a place where the sea was before them, mountains were on either side, and Pharaoh's army was um, within an eyesight uh, right behind it. Question, why did God bring the children of Israel to a place where he knew they would be terrified? No way of escape, no escape. Could not go forward, could not go to the sideways, and could not go backward. Why did God allow this? Uh, in the lives of the children of Israel. What was God trying to teach them? Yes, you know, this is a story, very familiar story to all of us. What was God trying to teach the children of Israel? Of course, they were in slavery for 400 years. And then many of them forgot even God. They would not have a relationship with God or no sacrifices, no relationship with God, no worship, synagogue, and so on. But the point is, but the question is, what is God trying to teach the children of Israel now? He's trying to test their faith. Then, sorry? He's Testing to their test faith? Yeah. Okay, that's good. But what is God trying to teach them? What should they learn from this experience? Do you think he was teaching them to depend on him completely? Okay. Trying to teach them to depend upon them completely. Yes. The word not completely God. is a wonderful word. Yes. On God, yes. Not on Moses, but on God. Moses himself could not do anything. But the picture that we have is that God was leading them, but as the, as the army came... We understand from the scripture that God went between the children of Israel and the enemy of Israel, that is a Pharaoh's army. The pillar went, and in fact, the pillar of not allow the Egyptian army to come and attack the children of Israel. Following the pillar doesn't assure us of a constant happiness. Following God and his instructions doesn't mean that we will not have problems in life. At least 
as the world that defines happiness. It also can be a harder experience because training in righteousness takes us to places that test our hearts, which are so naturally deceitful. Hearts are deceitful. Jeremiah writes in 17 and 9. During these difficulties, the key to knowing when we are truly following God is not necessarily the absence of trials or pain, but rather an openness to God's instruction and a continual submission of our minds and hearts to his leading. Beautiful. So following the pillar, following God's instruction, and yet we need to remember that we will have problems in life. But the thing is, every problem that we encounter is to teach us to depend upon God completely. Okay, what lesson did the children of Israel learn from this experience? Can someone read for us from Exodus chapter 14 and verse 31? Exodus, Exodus chapter 14 and verse 31. What lesson did the Israelites learn from this experience? 14.31. The Bible says it very clearly in Exodus chapter 14, verse 31. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Beautiful. So here we have this experience uh, uh, of dead end uh, teaching the children of Israel to fear God, to believe uh, God's leadership, and also to believe a uh, man of God who was leading at them. Okay. Any other comments I would like to make before we move into Monday's lesson? What is the meaning of uh, fearing God? There's another expression in the Bible which encapsulates all our relationship, grateful relationship with God. Fearing God is total submission, uh, following his way and uh, obeying his commandments and so on. Fearing God. Okay, Monday. Bitter waters. In this uh, uh, lesson, Monday's lesson, we have uh, two things that are pointed out. One is uh, bitter waters. And of course, the second one is uh, lack of water. And the water would gush from uh, the smitten a rock that is in Exodus chapter 17 and verses 1 to 7. But let's see this a bit of waters here. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. No water. Perhaps we might not get from God everything we want. But look at uh, what the author says here. But couldn't we expect to get all that we need? There's a difference between wanting, I mean, the wants and uh, needs. And the author asks a, a rhetorical question, meaning that the answer is implied in it. Yes, uh, God takes care of our needs. We may not give uh, everything that we want, but definitely supplies all our needs. Not what we think we need, but what we truly need. There was one thing the Israelites certainly needed, and that was water. Just after God in the cloud led the Israelites through the Red Sea, they followed him through the hot, waterless desert for three days. Three days. It's not a small amount of time when you need water almost every hour, at least every two hours, particularly in the desert where finding water is so critical, their desperation is understandable. When would they get the water they needed? So, where does God lead them? The pillar that goes to Mara, and then they see water, and the Bible tells us that as they tasted the water, they grumbled against Moses saying, where are we, sorry, what are we to drink? This is Exodus 15. 24. And then another experience a few days later, God does it again, this time again, and there's no water. And now this experience of God enabling Moses to give water 
for the children of Israel as Moses strikes the rock. Okay, these are familiar stories to all of us. What does Mara experience teach us, first of all? Water was there, water was bitter, and of course God tells Moses to throw a branch into the waters and the waters become sweet. Bitter water becomes sweet. What is God teaching them? And what is that we can learn from it today? They were excited to see the water. They ran and they fell almost like into the waters, drinking them. They grumbled and they were angry. Yes. Again, is it the same lesson? God wants. Let's read from Exodus chapter 15 and uh, verses 26 and 27. I'm reading from New King James Version. It said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Verse 27. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Okay, in short, we can understand that God wanted them to learn that it is safe for them, it is blessed for them to listen to the voice of the hearkening to the voice of God and keeping God's commandments. Obeying God, they have their needs met obeying God and they will have their needs met. There, was a, there is a question that is asked here at the bottom of Monday's lesson. Um, what are we to drink? That was a question the children of Israel asked in chapter 15. But in chapter 17, in verse 7, they're asking a question, is God among us? Is God among us? Is God going with us? Is God among us? No water, thirsty, desert, no sign of uh, seeing water anywhere. And then uh, these people ask this question. The author says, did you ever feel that God is not present with you? How many times have we, I mean, let me read from the lesson book itself. Have you ever asked the same question? Is God among us? You don't have to narrate the entire story, but... Uh, was there an experience in your life uh, uh, asking this a very question? Is God with me? Is God answering my prayer? Are my prayers ascending to the heavens? I think that the silence helps us understand that all of us uh, have had uh, similar experiences. Yes, Pastor. Uh, yes, uh, sir. The, 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 the beauty. Okay, of uh, the lessons, what we are learning is uh, many a times God is always there with us, but the question arises that are we with God? God is present in an unknown, uh, you know, we are unable to see because of sin, but can we feel his presence? You know, the lessons that we can be able to learn here is uh, we should feel his presence, we should experience it. Uh, many a times he takes us uh, uh, to a different level altogether. Uh, not to taunt us, uh, not to see that we are in lack of something. Uh, but I do believe that he takes us to that path. Uh, as Sister Patsy was talking about, we depend on him. So that our faith might be increased. Uh, so that we can experience it. And that's one of the reasons the Bible says, so taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, and uh, but, but if faith is not faith, uh, uh, what we can see, you know, faith is something unseen, hoped for. And God is trying to teach each one of us. His presence is always there, but can be feel it. You know, that feeling most probably comes out with experience. And I will take the example of Job. Okay. And Satan thought, uh, Job lost everything, uh, but uh, Satan never knew that God was everything to Job. Uh, if we can be able to understand that beautiful concept of 
understanding God. Uh, we are being a part of Him, even though He's unseen. Uh, his presence is there with us. If we can experience that part, either it might be pain or gain, or rain or sunshine, or difficulties and problems, uh, we will still trust Him, and He will be always there with us. He, he, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. His promises are always very much true. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. That's beautiful. So you pointed out that uh, um, the problem is that we don't see him. And that is why we sometimes don't trust that he is with us. But uh, the point is that he's always with us. Now, asking a question. Um, is there something that uh, uh, causes us doubt the presence of God? We have promise after promise that God is with us. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you till the end of the age. I mean, you see in uh, every book that God has promised his presence with us. The verse that we have read in uh, Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, it is a call for the children of Israel to obey God and obey his commandments. Hear the voice of God and obey his commandments. I want to suggest uh, this uh, morning, uh, friends, uh, that uh, disobedience may cause us to doubt uh, that God is in control of our lives. When we go uh, astray, when we deliberately break a commandment, when we do not cooperate with God and allow God to work in our lives, the knowledge that we may have that God is with us, the information that we may have from the Bible that God will never leave us, may not help us because we God is in control of us. This happened even in the life of Jacob, for example. Okay, thank you. And we will uh, move into Wednesday's, uh, sorry, uh, Tuesday's uh, lesson. This is uh, the great controversy in the desert. And we understand that this uh, is uh, Jesus had. And remember again, baptized when, along with the uh, fasting. And then we have uh, this great controversy picture between Christ and Satan, visible for the people who could be there, but it was uh, right on earth that uh, this happened. Let's read from verse uh, 1, and we will read verse 2 also. This is Luke 4. Then Jesus, being filled with uh, the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days and uh, uh, 40 days by the devil. So the question definitely is, uh, is it uh, that Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil? The Bible says it is spirit. And uh, even in the lesson book, we have uh, the word uh, spirit with a capital S. Definitely it is God's spirit, Holy Spirit. What are we to learn from this? <laughs> we understood from last week's lesson that God allows us, uh, in fact, takes us into painful experiences so that we can learn to depend upon God completely or even for our maturity. But what is the purpose of uh, Spirit leading Jesus Christ to be tempted by the devil? Was it anywhere for Christ's maturity? Christ should learn to depend upon God? What was the purpose of uh, this experience by the yeah, and Mike. Go ahead. Uh, personally, I feel that spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, and uh, uh, Jesus Christ are the part of the Trinity of the Godhead, as we all know about it. But in this case. The spirit has led 
Jesus Christ to the wilderness to be tempted by God because God himself being the son of God has set an example for each one of us, for you and for me, when we are faced with temptations and when the evil presence or the evil one has strength to take us our minds away from God, but we have to stand firm in the word of God so we can overcome. That's what God said. I have overcome the world so can so uh, as you also can do the same thing. And God God has led an example for each one of us so we can Thank you. Trust in God. Wonderful. So it is not for Christ's benefit that he was led into the wilderness to be tempted but it is for our benefit, particularly as to learn, uh, for us to learn as to how we can overcome the temptations of the evil one. Christ overcame by the use of God's word. For example, when he was tempted to turn uh, stones into bread, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. And in fact, he said, it is written. So it is for us to learn. By the way, it is not, or it is never God who tempts us. I want us to ask a question, very quick question, quick answer, please. What is the difference between a test and temptation? God never tempts. It is the devil who tempts. But God tests. Sometimes allows us to have even trials also. What is the difference between a temptation and a test? Test comes from God. Temptation comes from the devil. Okay, in the interest of time, let me move. God never tempts. We have uh, from the book of J James, and verse uh, 13 from chapter 1. But the point is that God gives us tests. The expected result of God's test is a victory. We'll be successful. But the expected result of a temptation which comes from a devil is that we lose. So in other words, uh, tests that come to God-fearing people, yes, help them, but uh, tests of righteous people will help others maybe in their own generation but in the generations to come as well okay i don't know how much time we have but looks like it's already done wednesday enduring a legacy and here we have a peter talking about the text that we have just as the key text and we will like quickly look at this uh, first peter chapter one verses six and seven what is peter saying here in short peter is saying a trials do come <clears throat> but they are for a short time. I would like to also say that uh, those who don't fear God and go away from God, they, it may appear that uh, there is a lot of pleasure and a lot of happiness in this world, but we want to remember that the pleasure is also for a short time for them. Rejoicing happens for righteous people, those who fear God, and that is uh, ceaseless ages of eternity. They will continue to rejoice. Yes. Okay, question is, uh, I mean, this is the first time I'm asking a question and I entertained it for the first time also. How do Christians rejoice, by the way? Philippians 4, 4 says rejoice in the Lord. Of course, we want to rejoice in the Lord. But what is to rejoice in the Lord? If you ask a person what to rejoice, what is to marry, um, I mean, they have a lot, all kinds of things to say. Okay, eat, drink, and dance, and all these things. Can someone help me understand what is to rejoice in the Lord? How do we rejoice in the Lord? One thing. How do we rejoice in the Lord? Yeah, rejoicing in the Lord is uh, it's a very personal experience, I guess, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, that yes, is, uh, when you commune with God, uh, when you uh, stay with God and stay focused and connected with Him. I think so uh, that rejoicing and joy is not the way how the world portrays it to be. It is the inner part of it which will be seen uh, in an external part of our life. Uh, so uh, 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 if I have to uh, you know, just come to a consensus and say what rejoicing is all about, it's your personal experiences with God which will enable you, uh, okay, to be more happy, more content, and uh, okay, in everything you find a uh, pleasure in the Lord, in everything that you try to uphold, 
in everything you give honor to him, in everything you portray him, in everything, uh, 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 I think so, you will take pleasure. So it is not that you are trying to, but when the Spirit of the Lord is there with you, in you, uh, in whatever the circumstances you might be, you know, you have a good sleep even in the prison, just like John the Baptist or, or, or the first century Christians who gave up their lives, uh, you know, for the sake of the gospel. And that was rejoicing. When Paul was in the prison, he simply simplified and said, uh, okay, that uh, he was singing song and uh, he was praising God. And uh, I can't just imagine that was the joy, that was the real joy. It is not that drinking and dancing and uh, giving up to a while to get pleasure. You know, we try to get pleasure out of something from outside. But this is from within. When the Spirit of the Lord is there with you, I think so it becomes automatic. You don't need to try to be happy. You don't need to try to rejoice. You don't need to borrow some uh, a happiness somewhere. Okay. But it is within us. And that's, that's an experience, I believe. Okay. I say amen to that, what Pastor said. Okay, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Meaning I, it's, a, uh, it's an inside job. And uh, are we saying that uh, people cannot see us that we are happy? Or can we not identify people who are rejoicing? People uh, yeah, who are crying, uh, it is very easy. You're absolutely right, sir, when you said that one. Okay, when, uh, when the in internal part of your life is happy, it shows out, you see. So when people see us, uh, we are different. You know, in spite of suffering, we are happy. In spite of lacking, we are happy. In spite of everything. So people will recognize that Christ likeness, Christ is very in us. You know, um, uh, that's, that's what uh, I, I, I try to mean about and uh, that's what the Bible exemplifies. That, that's what Paul is talking in uh, the book of Philippians, uh, rejoice always. So you're not trying something different, you know, to be happy or to rejoice, but that's automatic, which is inwardly bound. Okay, so when Christ dwells in us, okay, so that, that's, the, that's the reason that the Bible says it very clearly, as Paul puts it in, he says when, uh, when Christ is there with us, you become a new creature. Okay, you don't need to create yourself to be something outside. But it's automatic within each one of us. And that's an experience with God. It's all about. Okay, can we say that uh, a person who rejoices, he is uh, not impatient? Oh, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And a person who rejoices doesn't grumble, murmur? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Your contact with the other hand. Oh, oh, good or bad, okay, rain or sunshine. Uh, happiness of you know sadness in you know, everything you be just uh, in a static level you know you just go on the same momentum okay rather than grumbling or complaining okay and uh, things like that okay beautiful to conclude uh, we'll go to the Thursday's lesson we have the experience of Alex here I'm sure you read this entire story here and he was into drugs and then he was led to the uh, truth and then, in fact, he wanted to be a minister and he wanted to study theology. And there he again had experience of pain and he fell again. And in fact, the struggle that he had with drugs earlier, that became a struggle for them as well. And so the author asks a question. The author is asking a question. If Alex should meet with you, what counsel would you give? How do you encourage him? And of course, the author gives several texts from the Bible. Uh, for example, we have uh, Proverbs 3, Jeremiah 29, 13, and so on, Romans 8, 28, Roman, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Hebrews 13, 5. Several things we can learn from all these texts, but the thing is, how do you counsel, how do you encourage this person who is, I mean, who is uh, doing his very best to depend upon the Lord and to do everything possible to share the gospel, and yet a trial after a trial comes? How do you encourage him? Uh, last week, uh, we were dealing in the Sabbath school lesson that uh, the characteristics of a fire is to burn. It is simple. Uh, like, for example, you throw paper in it, it uh, becomes ashes. You throw a little bit of wood, it becomes a charcoal. And uh, when you throw a little bit of gold into the fire, it purifies. You know, 
Uh, God wants to see that the dross of sin is removed in each one of our lives. Uh, many a times, in an initial step, like just like Joseph, you know, he, he, he wanted it to be a seasoned persona uh, to be used by him. Pure gold. Daniel, God wanted to use him to be as a pure gold. Shardak Major Kavitabo. So what goes into the fire? You know, uh, we are battling between the great controversy. Sin has been engulfed our lives in one way or the other in the form of a dross. Supposed to be gold, but dross has been got into our lives. So God is trying to teach us something here in this one. You know, when sometimes God puts us into the fire, it is not to destroy or to purify. So what goes into the fire matters. When a, a, a person like you and me, being God's child, goes into the fire, what should come out of the fire is pure gold. A pure gold becomes a very beautiful ornament. You know, the, the trial might be difficult, but the outcome is such a beautiful thing, and very precious, and very expensive. And, uh, and, 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 and what we can say for him? Uh, so what is readily available? No. Most probably we have to okay, think, think in terms where uh, when God sometimes puts us into a fairy furnace, he wants us to come out as gold. And Joseph made it up, Jacob made it up, and uh, all the our patriarchs made it up. Uh, disciples made up, and uh, we know, and that's one of the reasons uh, Paul is the only person in the whole of the Bible, if I'm not mistaken. He says, I won the race, I fought a good fight, and I know there is a crown waiting for me. So, so confident in his statement. Nobody was so confident in the Bible, like the way how uh, Paul could say. And that was the outcome of uh, a trial which took Paul. In every angle of his life. That's wonderful. Thank you. And we are asking a question how do we counsel Alex? But here we have several uh, Bible references here Romans 8 28. Everything works for good for those who love God. Yes, we may see a trial experience, but something good is happening in your life. 2 Corinthians 12 9. This is in response to what Paul asked God at least thrice. Remove this uh, thorn from my flesh. And uh, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. Hebrews 13, 5. We know that God has promised to Joshua. And Paul is repeating in Hebrews 13, God saying, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Meaning, Alex, remember that God has not given up on you. And he will never give up on you. He will continue to work in your life. And everything will work for the best of uh, you. I'll read this statement. Then I will close. I'll make two points and I will close. This is Friday's lesson, but um, God does not always bring us to pleasant places. What will happen if everything is pleasant? We may become self-sufficient and we will not need even the help of God. He permits trials and disappointments so that uh, we grow in faith as it was already pointed out by Pastor Jeffrey. Two things. Councils for the church. Then White says, the goldsmith never throws pebbles into the fire. Goldsmith never throws pebbles into the fire. He throws only gold, and the result is pure gold. It was already told to us. But another beautiful thing is when God allows us to experience pain or even when God leads us into pain we may, must remember the picture that the, the Bible gives about God is that God goes with us even into that painful experience I'll say it again when God allows us pain painful experience in our lives or when God leads us into hardships trials tests whatever it is we can always trust that God is with us example when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, God was with them. Daniel thrown into the lion, very much with him. Cannot go. 
God will not ask us to stay in a place where he will not be with us. Just a 13 will not allow us to be tempted. We can bear. This is beautiful promise that we have. Yes, pain comes, but we have the assurance that God enables us to bear that pain or to overcome that pain. May God bless us that uh, even in pain we see gain. For the God, God fearing, for the God fearing, pain never goes in vain. Pain always has gain, either for ourselves or for others uh, who know about our own experience. May God bless us to remain faithful despite the problems in life. Thank you very much for your participation and God bless each of us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Varaprasad, for getting a deeper uh, meaning in our Sabbath school lesson today. And uh, we appreciate uh, your participation too. Uh, we, uh, all of you participated with us today. And uh, I think so, the Sabbath school often will be connected. And uh, after which, I think so, Dr. Varaprasad will be able to lead us in a closing prayer okay, for the Sabbath school. Um, but this one is enough from uh, hospital. Okay. Uh, okay. Every day, do that. 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 Do Do that. Holy Father, we want to thank you for your presence with us and thank you so very much, Lord, for the privilege that we have given to us to worship you on this uh, Sabbath day, in these holy hours. We praise you, Holy Father, for the ministry that happens to hope aside in a community church. We praise you, Heavenly Father, even for the lesson that we have discussed. Help us, Father, to remember that you are always with us. Mm. When things go right, Heavenly Father, we know that you are with us. But even when things go wrong, Against our will, we need to explain to the experience. Help us remember that you are with us. Enable us to overcome every trial, temptation, test that may come to us. Thank you so very much, Father, that you will do this and even much more than we have asked or imagined. Please are prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we'll just take a break of, for a few minutes and we'll prepare for the Divine Hour. And uh, we, we'd love to see you join our Divine, okay, divine service. Thank you. Thank you.